Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the new screensavers is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. The new screensavers is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Ancient organics discovered on Mars highlights from WWDC and an Android PDA. Live from the Twit Studios in Petaluma, California, it's the new Screensavers. Justin, visiting us from Brea, California. Hello and welcome to the new Screensavers, episode 160, Saturday, June 9th, 2018. I'm Leo Laporte. And I'm Jason Snell. Snell is in the house from Six Colors. One of many Jasons who appears on this show. <laughs> you have to be named Jason to be on the show. We've got a good one coming up today. Forget the uh, BlackBerry Key 2. I have, this is my new Android device. I should uh, hold it like that so you can only see the phone. But then, look, there's a real keyboard. If you were a Scion fan back in the day, you'll recognize this. This is from Planet Computers. They're bringing the PDA back, baby, with the Gemini. I have a review for you coming and up. And we are going to talk to a real live NASA astrobiologist, Jen Eigenbrode, who's going to tell us about what they found on Mars. I want to say what they found on Mars this week. They found it like two years ago, yeah. I have been checking since then. <laughs> yeah, it's but taken a while. it's a mind-blowing discovery. It so is. We're gonna, we're gonna go to Mars. The yeah. first camera to shoot in Google's VR 180 format is out. It's called the Lenovo Mirage camera, and it shoots in stereoscopic. I've been really curious about this, because this is the new thing. It's not only, it's 180 degrees, but it's stereo. Anyway, Jason Howell has his review coming up in just and a little bit. And Megan Maroney's gonna do us a solid and show us where Amazon Echoes are storing all of our voice data. I love that. It's and fun to go back to and delete them. Yeah. yeah, you can do that with Google Assistant too. Yeah. Hear all the silly things you said, including swearing. She's keeping track, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll answer a few Mac-centric viewer questions because when Jason's in the house, we gotta do that. Call for help and mailbag coming up. But let's start with the hot topics oh, yes. of the week. 7.5 billion dollars microsoft buys github this happened uh late sunday we, we talked a little bit about it on twitter when it was speculation and then they confirmed it on monday i think became official on monday github which is a very popular among open source developers open source projects it's using a open source program called git which is a source code repository allows you to collaborate with others on a on a program, you upload your bit of source code, they upload their bits, it keeps track of it all, you can go back if something didn't work, you can verify it, you can do code review, lots of nice features. GitHub is one of a lot of different ways to use Git. I mean, I use Git locally on my computer. Right. But, you, but the nice thing about GitHub is a great place to share code. A lot of open source developers are a little perturbed because they still see Microsoft as the evil empire. Yeah, but this really is the new Microsoft. This is Satya Nadella's Microsoft, where they are not about, it's not Steve Ballmer's era, right? Where it was all, it's all about Windows, it's all about Office. With Satya Nadella, it's all about- Ballmer called Linux a cancer. Exactly right, yeah. but here we are, and they want, you know, Microsoft is the biggest user of GitHub, right? And they are believers in empowering developers, and they are building their future on cloud development. And this is the new Microsoft. I think it's a, I think it's a smart deal for them. <laughs> GitLab, a competing Git web-based repository, saw a spike when the news sure. came out. Because a lot of people said, oh, I'm getting hey, out of here. I have but, a friend who won't buy an Xbox because he doesn't, because exactly. he used the Mac exactly. in the 80s. And it tends to be <laughs> open source. No. <laughs> it tends to be open source guys and sure. people who have a, a preconceived notion about Microsoft. But I think the, the, the real truth of this is they'd raised $350 million. They were burning through it. They were losing money very fast. GitHub was. Uh, uh, and, and it really, to me, this is Microsoft saving them. And I think they are saving them for the right reasons. We'll see in time. We'll and see. they are the biggest user of the service. So they have a right. stake in it from, you know, not only do they know 
how it works, and they like it, but they want it to keep going. There's some concern. I mean, you can have private, most of the repositories are public, but you can have private right. repositories there, but still Microsoft would have access to those in theory, and there are people worried, well, I'm not going to post code there that Microsoft could look at and potentially borrow, and so I understand the concern. I mean, that's, that's a waste of $7 billion if they're going to do that. But, <laughs> yeah, they shouldn't. Uh, it seems unlikely, but yeah, I mean, you should trust your, you should always trust your cloud storage provider whoever it is, whoever owns you them. You have to. You have to do that. Yeah. And so if somebody don't doesn't use them trust if you Microsoft, don't trust them. fair yeah. enough. But I think yeah. Microsoft's interest here is probably pretty so. on the up and up. Speaking of trust, have you, did you see the ad yesterday on the NBA Finals Facebook ad? We, you know, you joined Facebook mm. to share photos with family and friends. And then they acted as if like it was something that happened to them. Yeah. And then bad things happen, bad to, things happen to us. Sometimes. And, and, but now it's, it's just like the Wells Fargo ad, right? Mm -hmm. And now we're the new Facebook and, and we're going to respect your privacy because we know that Facebook works when everybody keeps it going. And then, of course, uh, shortly thereafter, we learned that Facebook inadvertently set 14 million users' private posts public. Public. Ooh. They said, uh, it's a software bug, and they went back, and uh, once they figured it out, and changed all those posts to private. Oops. But this is something really important. See, there it is. Due to a technical error, we recommend you review the audience of your recent posts. Sorry about that. It's just a technical error. Well, I'm sure it is. I'm sure Nevertheless, it is. this is exactly the problem. When you post stuff on the internet, it isn't private necessarily. Not and, necessarily. And pretty much every time people post something private on Facebook, it somehow magically leaks out to the public. So also, don't, tr don't, tr don't put anything private on it. It says something about reputation, too, because if this was a mistake by a company that people weren't angry at right. and felt that they were exploiting th their privacy, then people would be more likely to say, yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know. You, I think they'd be pretty you, upset. I think, well, yeah, but, but more if you likely. Posted pictures, Facebook, it's the worst possible thing that could have happened for Facebook. <laughs> right. The worst. I think people would be upset no matter what, but you're right. So it depends on what got public, but yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's, that's true. It's pretty you should bad. Never, you should never put something on the internet. If, that's, the, that's the bottom line. If you are worried that somebody else might see it. Like, yeah. don't, just don't, don't do that. I tell teenagers that. Don't put anything on the internet. I don't care if it's Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, whatever that you didn't want your grandma to see. Yeah, buy an old laptop, put in a floppy disk, yeah. type your thoughts in there, So last, that's it. Last week, <laughs> and burn it. Last week we, uh, we showed uh, Priv, or Privy, Privy, which is a new privacy-focused sure. sharing service where you can only share with each other. You probably also a word bit. for an outhouse, which <laughs> is a little bit weird, but okay. And it's cool, but it's the same problem, which is, of course, it's intended to be private, but anytime you're posting it somewhere on a server, it can always be public. Plus, the other the other person could disclose it. Well, later, that's true which, too. We, which we see that happens yeah, all the time. Yeah, you control of it. I'm getting more and more. I'm increasingly of the opinion that really, I point. You know, I know this is people are going to get mad at me for saying this. Social media has made us psychotic. I think it really has made uh, our culture somewhat disturbed. And when I go on Twitter and I see how angry, I've seen normal people turn into rabid, rabid, angry. Yeah, rage monsters. Rage monsters. Mm -hmm. And I think if it weren't for that platform, they would probably not have become that way. But there's something about it. And I'm really starting to think, we made a mistake. All this social media has been bad for us. You, yeah, I think so. I mean, I call Twitter an outrage machine all the time. It and is. I like I like Twitter and I am I am accepting of the fact that it is an outrage machine. I, and I can't, I have to either heavily kind of like filter what I see right. on Twitter sometimes or just log out because yeah. when people are raging, I like, I get, I don't want, if someone wants to be angry, fine, fine, but I don't want to see it. It's too it's easy. to make me angry. It's too easy. It makes it too easy. It makes you angry. Yeah. And then the outrage snowballs. It's too easy to become that way. And it lends itself because of its truncated nature. It lends itself to those sniping quick things. And I really think that actually the real risk is not what you're going to see there, but that it's going to turn. I know some very nice people who love Twitter, very nice people who have recently gotten in trouble on Twitter because the outrage bubbles yeah. up and it, and it doesn't go away. Twitter is permanent. You know what would be good is if your phone operating system looked at how often you use social media. <laughs> All right, let's talk about said, that. And then said, you may Stop be it. using it too much. Knock it off. WWDC, the Apple Worldwide Developers Conference, kicked off on Monday. Monday. We were, you were at the I keynote. Yeah. We were watching it remotely on the live stream and talking about it with uh, our friends. 
Um, okay, got to start with disappointment. No new hardware. We'd heard the rumor, and I credited the rumor from Mark Gurman the, the, the Friday before, but it was true. There was nothing. They didn't even, yeah. they didn't even say anything about not well, being any new hardware. Well, they did. Actually, one of the things they said right at the front was, it's all about software. Okay. And that was the, the clue. <laughs> if you're waiting for hardware, you're going to be That's really true. sad That's true. That was now. in the first sentence. And I this, think. Is yeah. not, this is the one time of year where there is probably going to be no hardware at an Apple event. If they've got something ready, they might drop it. But it's a software event. It always is. But so, last year, they announced yeah. the HomePod. They announced they had, they had the iMac to the, Pro. Updates to the laptops. All of that stuff And they, And year. I feel we're due. It doesn't happen. Yeah, it feels like there's something coming either this summer or, yeah. or early fall but obviously it was not ready for this week and don't blame do I, I don't blame apple necessarily it may be that intel was not ready and couldn't produce Possible. chips that apple needed in quantity apple required or, it, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and, and apple's always been good about not announcing something until it's ready and i i honor them although and the home pod they, they announced a, a little too early a little early Maybe they learned their lesson there <laughs> it was a little early but, uh, yeah, you know, it's not bad if you don't announce something if you have nothing to say. That's right. not bad. And there's nothing stopping them from announcing new tomorrow. stuff. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, next week, next week. The morning. only reason it's a concern is I tell people, uh, you know, in, in April and May, oh, well, whatever you do, don't buy an iPhone, and a Mac, or an iPad because... WWDC's in June. Right. Those people have been waiting. Right. The iPhone will be in September, right? We all know that. There was a rumor maybe the uh, SE, SE would be up yeah. Because that's pretty super I'm a fan now. of that one. And it, it could still happen this summer. The other thing is Apple can call an event on two weeks' notice and or on a week's notice, right. really, and people will come. And so, they can release products without an event and people will still pay attention. So there's lots. Apple's got a lot of other options. I have to say, I products. think that means still... Do not buy a MacBook at this point, right? I Yeah, I have a bunch of people whose kids are going off to college, and they're like, I want to buy them a laptop. And wait. right now, it's like, I told them all to wait <laughs> until this week, and they're going to come back to me and say, well, now what? And I don't know. I mean, you if, you can wait, if you can wait, that's fine. This it's is an, an iPad. iPad with a keyboard, man. I think you'd be okay. <laughs> I think you'd be okay <laughs> weird uh, stuff. with an don't iPad do Pro. That's relatively up to date. Yeah, the iPad Pro. I mean, there will probably be an iPad Pro update, though, in the next few months that will have, you know, no home button and the a notch on it like the iPhone uh, 10. Yeah. So that's Apple talked about software, and they talked about it in the four big categories of OS. Well, three big and Apple TV. <laughs> I thought there burn, was one. There were a burn. couple of big updates to Apple TV. Well, let's start with TV right. OS. There was Watch OS, iOS, and of course Mac OS. But TV OS, they actually did something very exciting. They added Dolby Atmos. Yes. It is now the only streaming device, according to Apple, that does both Dolby Vision, the HDR uh, protocol, and Dolby Atmos. That's the speakers from above. That, that's pretty exciting. That's there are a lot of home, home theater people who are really frustrated that when the Apple TV 4K shipped, it didn't quite have the right stuff for HDR. You right. had to set it, and non-HDR content looked weird. They did a bunch of software updates for that, and then this update adds Dolby Atmos. It makes me want to go out and get an Atmos speaker system. To be honest. I like Atmos. I didn't At first, I thought it was uh, kind of a gimmick, but they have an Atmos theater down the road here. Mm -hmm. And man, it sounds great. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah. So I'd like to have Atmos in my little... So, you know, home theater man yeah. cave. And there's some new screensavers. Yay. Oh, I like the NASA They got the NASA screensavers. screensavers are beautiful. Right. Speaking so of check NASA. TV OS off. That's good. <laughs> Mac OS, we're going to get Mojave. Yes. We're going to get dark mode. Yes. Mac OS 10, 14. A lot of people are really excited about dark mode. I don't really entirely understand it. it well, is, if you're a photographer. It's a new look. Yeah, sure. The pros will like it because that's you, get the, you get the, the white blocks out of the way and make everything a little bit darker. Now, you've been watching the Mac forever, as mm -hmm. I have. I thought the most exciting thing to me, the most encouraging thing was they're adding capabilities to Finder. Finder oh, yeah. has been neglected. Remember the Finder? Forever. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, they, and, and, you know, I've been looking, reading the tea leaves for signs at Apple. It doesn't care about the Mac. The biggest sign is they don't seem to be releasing new hardware very fast. But the fact that they put energy into adding, I think, some significant features mm -hmm. to Finder was very encouraging. And the Finder is the core of the Mac experience. It's the, really the one thing that there's no equivalent for. I guess the Files app on iOS. I mean, it's the file system. It's where you launch apps. It's, you live it's in the you, Finder. You live in the Finder if you're a Mac user. And you're going to live in it even more because one of the things that's always been uh, a big deal in computer science was the document-centric operating system. Everybody's been trying to do this. Windows Longhorn was an attempt to make a right. document-centric file system. Apple's pink. Remember Taligent, mm -hmm. the thing that they did with IBM? The whole idea was, you know, the way computers stand 
kind of still today is you have documents, you have applications, and in order to work on a document, you launch an application and then you work within that application on the document. But computer scientists have always thought, well, that's very m what we call modal. It means you're in this mode or you're in that mode. Wouldn't it be, shouldn't an operating system just let you do things to documents without launching applications? And to me, that's what this is. You're now able to, in Finder, do simple modifications right. to photos. Uh, you're able to do... It's actually incredibly powerful. This sign new, PDFs. This and new, preview. and you've had some of this has been in the Finder, but it's always been hidden. But now um, Apple is leaning into it. There's this whole gallery view, which lets you walk through your files and see them uh, previewed at high resolution. And then there are action buttons on the side. You Love can see that. complete metadata for a whole bunch of different file types. You can set what the metadata that you want to see is. And then these action buttons will let you, yeah, edit PDFs, edit images, and you can kick off a workflow, an Apple script, a shell script, anything that you want. That was another great buttons. thing. They fired Sal Sagoyan, the creator of Automator, uh, last year or the year before. Very sad thing. I thought, oh, this is the end of Apple script and automation. Automator got mentioned on stage. They mentioned it. They yeah. don't have Sal. But I'm sure Sal was sitting there going, yeah, well, that's really good news. Yeah, and there there's an iOS update that we'll get to in a minute that was also like huge, similar kind similar of stuff. workflow related yeah. news. But yeah, this is a uh, this is great. The Finder is going to be a lot better. I think though the big Mac announcement was that four of the apps that Apple is putting on Mac OS Mojave are iOS apps, and that yeah. next year anybody who develops iOS apps will be able to bring those apps to the Mac with what Apple says is minimal effort which is huge because there are way more apps on iOS than there are on the Mac. This, I will argue with you, is the worst possible thing that could happen. And I know you know why I think this. So right before this, Craig Federighi, who's in charge of operating systems at Apple, says, people ask us, are we merging Mac OS and iOS? No. Yep. 40 foot letters come down saying no. no. But what we are doing is merging the app platform. <laughs> and then immediately after, Says, but now you can put your iOS well, apps next on year. Mac OS. Yeah, yeah. they're trying coming, this year. Coming ne soon. Next year they're going to do We're going to do four of them just to show you it's possible. Right. There's lots of issues. I mean, lots of Mac, lots of iOS apps won't work very well on a Macintosh. They're not designed for a non-touch screen. It's going to be kind of a kooky thing. It worries Maybe. me because it means developers are now going to... Even they've already started abandoning the Mac. This is just one more yeah. reason for them to abandon the Mac. I'm going to disagree with you because I think the deal is already done. That if you don't want to write a classic Mac using Mac app using um, AppKit, which is what they call it, the the system of writing apps for the Mac, you're already using like Slack, right? They're using Electron, which is basically a web browser inside it's Chrome. an yeah. app interface. And you're, you're, it's already there. We're already there. Twitter pulled their app from the Mac. So what? So what you're Apple saying, saying this is, is just saying we might as well make it a deal. Every I, iOS is the most thriving software platform in the world. Um, every iOS developer is a Mac user because it's the only place you can develop Mac apps. The Mac is now not the second choice for software developers. It's the fourth or fifth choice behind iOS, Android, Windows, probably the web itself, and then there's the Mac. So what are they going to do? They can they can just take the that hose of iOS apps and just shower it on the Mac. And I think that's what they're going to do. And I think it'll be successful if they make uh, the transition properly, which is why they're building those four apps themselves, because they're going to find all of the problems with it, hopefully, and fix those before it gets turned on. There, there are people out there, Steve Trouton Smith, who is this kind of mad genius who uh, digs into all the little files that Apple releases, has already got his apps, uh, his iOS apps running on the Mac, just unofficially. And uh, he says it's actually pretty good, and with a year's development time, it could be pretty great. Um, and but it, what it does mean is means that the end of the Macintosh it, is what it means. Yes, what it does mean is the Mac is now more going to be a superset of iOS, where it'll be like you run iOS stuff, and then there's some Mac stuff that also so, runs on it. Are we merging Mac OS and iOS? No, of course not. Why do we merge them? We're just going to kill I Mac think, OS I, outright. I don't think it's going to die outright, but I think that its relevance, which was already fading, will continue to yeah. fade. We made a joke uh, at WWDC this week that in five years' time, you may be able to buy a Mac and, a, and an iPad, and literally the difference is whether the keyboard is bundled with it or not. Right. Because really, a touchscreen Mac, a uh, well, they'll never do a touchscreen Mac. With, they're gonna. This is this is the future. But they. But what you I have think, right here but is Leo, the future of computing. Once every app on the Mac, more or less, is an iOS app with touch built in. Why wouldn't you 
build a touchscreen. Well, I understand, but... Why wouldn't you make a convertible Mac laptop at that point so you can run all those iOS apps with touch? Or why would you What if I don't want to run iOS apps? What if I want to run Photoshop, Lightroom, uh, Xcode? What if I want to run well, Mac apps? What if I want Terminal? Those are still there, and that's I think that's what defines what is different between iOS and a Mac at this point, is things it's, like Terminal. It's, it's just those little things. It's, and yeah. it's the pro uses, and the Mac is going to become a thing that pro users want, and most people don't. So that's what I felt like. That's, this this yeah. keynote giveth and taketh away. On the one hand, they show we're, 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 we're going to focus on pros by doing dark mode. Mm -hmm. We're going to add capabilities to Finder, something we haven't done in decades. And then they say, and you're going to be able to, all you developers, stop developing for the Mac because here's the good news. Your iOS apps will work great on the Mac. Well, the problem is there are serious limits with what an iOS app can do. And there are no limits with what a Mac well, app can do. And now, that's this is an difference. interesting thing. This was, and I want to know if you saw more about this, because one of the things that also happened, and was a, quite a surprise, is they said coming to the Mac App Store, the newly redesigned Macintosh App Store, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to suddenly add uh, uh, BB Edits, bare bones softwares, BB Edit. We're yes. going to suddenly add Panic Softwares, Transmit, Transmit. Yeah. two programs that were pulled off the Mac App Store because yes. the App Store didn't let its develop the developers, Panic and Rich Siegel at Bare Bones, do the things they needed to do to make those apps useful. Exactly. Plus, they inter they disintermediated the app developers from their customers. You had to go through Apple. They took 30%. Mm -hmm. The App Store wasn't a great experience for some developers. It was an untenable experience for many developers. Now they're coming to the App Store. Right. And I also heard, and I hope this is, I think this is false, that Apple is in the future contemplating the notion of only allowing apps to be sold in the App Store or... So that's not quite you right. You have to have a, a signed, there's, they so have to be signed. There's a few things going on Apple here. has to approve your app. What they're, first, what they're doing is they've changed a bunch of stuff on the Mac App Store to allow apps like Transmit and BB Edit to go in. And they're really doing that by letting apps ask for more permissions right. than they used they're to be allowed. They're increasing the number of entitlements, which exactly. is what you need to ask so for. The idea they're is, also enlarging the sandbox. Right, well, the sandbox, my understanding is the sandbox is going to be able to cover like the whole file system, right. or at least most of the file system, right. which was completely forbidden before. Right. But now, well, if you're an app... Well, that's why you app, couldn't do Transmit. Yeah, it has so FTP if, you're, program. if you're an app that wants to ask for permission, it'll say, Transmit wants to read your hard drive. Is that okay? And you can say yes, and it will actually get approved. That's good news. It's a huge step forward. Still bad for developers in the respect that they lose 30%, they lose their relationship, direct relationship with sure. their customers, things like that. Sure, although it's better than it used to be since Phil it's, Schiller It's better took than it not over. selling any apps. And it's better than not selling any apps. <laughs> yeah. I think the other thing that's going on is Apple is changing what happens a little bit on the outside. Developers already, by default, you, um, you are a, a registered Apple developer and you sign your app. Yeah. You don't have to submit it to Apple. But by default, those apps that are signed will open, and if they're not signed, you get an alert saying this was. And you can you can work around it and open it's it. It's a and simple you can turn workaround. Many of us off. have done that. You right click on the app, you select open, select open, and it, open. And it opens. Or Is you that can just going turn away? That away. No. No, there's been no announcement about that. Okay. However, they are changing what they're doing to something a little bit more granular and a little bit more invasive, which is called notarized apps. This and is the Gatekeeper app that's going to do this? Yeah, the Gatekeeper app that's already there. Yeah. But now, notarized apps, you basically, you, when you build your app as a developer, you upload it to a server. Apple does a malware scan and gives you a ticket. And then you release the app. Okay. And what that allows is, first off, it allows Apple, if you have a problem with a specific app or specific version, they can kill that app without killing your entire yep. developer account, which is good because all your apps die if they do that. Yep. Um, but it does mean that someplace at Apple, there's something that's saying yes or no to your apps. And it sounds like, by default, you're going to have to do this in a year or two. You're That's have what to I do was this. thinking. Okay. I, they haven't announced. I would imagine they're still going to let you run anything unsigned if you want to, but it's going to be behind that wall if you're going to have to change a setting or you're going to have okay. to do a, a, a kind of weird control click, choose open kind of thing. Well, watch with interest. But they could, if they wanted to, they could close that door entirely, and that would be um, right. a, more of a problem. And, uh, you know, if it's just a malware scan, I don't have any problem with that. But then Apple says, oh, and by the way, we don't want any political statements or pornography. Or right, if they, they want it to just be automated because the idea is that you're in the Mac App Store, somebody looked at it. This is completely automated. Good. Then again, Apple says they're shooting for an hour turnaround, which frustrated a lot of developers because they, you know, they're know they trying to do a bug fix and then they upload the file and they just hope that Apple gets it they back wait. to them in an hour. It's kind they of wait. annoying. So. They wait. Anyway, the Mac is at least a subject of discussion. A little turmoil. Nice.
A little turmoil. Better than no talk at all. A little turmoil in the Mac world, <laughs> but we'll watch with interest. Now, let's get to iOS. Yeah. And the most important new feature of iOS, Memoji! No. <laughs> you were alluding to it when we began this conversation. Screen time, Screen yeah. Screen time. Yeah, so Apple's taking all of the things it learned about monitoring your health and applying it to monitoring your use of iOS devices. So, so you'll be able to get granular information yeah. about how much time Charts, you're spending. Charts. How many times you pick up your phone, how much time wow. you spend with your phone unlocked, what apps you use in categories, or you can drill down into a specific app. So I think and that's the biggest kids. one. And your, and your kids. kids. So you can view those from device using family sharing. You can see how your kids are using it. And then you can do settings. Now for adults, it's a warning. It says, hey, you know, you've used Twitter for 20 hours today, <laughs> and maybe you should cut back. Uh, you, you can also set restrictions for kids. Right. But So there, there are enough places where it's letting you kind of prod yourself into yeah, and you getting go, off of Twitter or it. getting yeah. off of Instagram Actually, or whatever. Actually, Google's Android is more yeah. locked down in this new feature in, I, in Android P. You have to go into settings and disable it if yeah, you want Apple's to Yeah, Apple's going to let you just app. tap and say yeah. continue yeah. using. But, but they're they, both working on the same it's thing. It's the same. Really, it is the, the principle that you don't realize how much you're using it. Exactly. So if they give you data little and then stuff. they give you that little prod and say, oh, you know, you, you said to warn you when you got to this point, then uh, that will be enough for you. You have to want to change, right? You have to want to change. <laughs> they're not going to make you change. You, you have, have to hit to, bottom. You actually have to want it, and then so, they'll let you do it. And it'll even block websites. That's one of the most clever things. If you say block social media and then you go to Facebook it'll say smart enough I yeah you you said not to let you go to Facebook now. I have to say there was a <laughs> subtext of Facebook hate throughout the keynote there were jabs there were digs yeah. and they honestly eat. it's a good time for it right? yeah the now's the time the, the, the spirit of the country and the world is not for Facebook yeah, right now yeah and it's good for Apple's business. Uh, it is you know it looked like they're taking the Facebook and Twitter links out of Mojave that they yeah, they, I mean, they're already out of iOS. I think that was a, a thing where they're just kind of cleaning up okay. stuff that was okay. already kind of going on the way out. They decided direct links into social media in the account settings was not That something. was just so you could easily share to your Facebook or Yeah, whatever. and I think the idea is apps can share with that. each other anyway. They don't need a system level thing so, to do that. Uh, so uh, what else is in, the, is in the health and wellness part of iOS? There's, oh, there's do actually, not disturb. Do right? not disturb got a lot smarter where it knows about like time and your calendar and things like that. So you can say, don't disturb me in my meeting that or I'm having right now. Give me notifications when the meeting ends. Right. Or, or when, when I, I leave, leave work. the building. Yeah. I love yeah. That. yeah. So that's really smart because it lets you feel like I, I think a lot of people don't turn on do not disturb because then they forget and it's right. and it's on it and they miss everything. Yeah. But if you can say just an hour or just for this meeting or just when I'm at this location and then it'll flip back off. So I think that's good. Nice and features. I think Notification Center in general got a huge upgrade that I've been joking for a while that I want an unsubscribe link in every notification I get. Now you got and it. And they did it. They did it. You can say... And by the way, notice which one. Scroll uh, up a little bit more. Is it a uh, Facebook Anthony, notification? Yeah. No, the other way. Yeah, right oh, there. Oh, look. Yeah. Oh, look. Which oh, no. one might you want to turn off? Facebook. So two options here, which is also interesting. Deliver quietly. And the idea there is instead of it buzzing your phone... Yeah and bringing it up on the lock screen, it'll deliver the notification and you can see it in the notification Apple's center. Apple's need this for a while. It's such a pain to yeah. go to settings. And, and then there's turn off and a settings link, right? So this is this is the whole thing. You can unsubscribe, you can make it a muted like notification, like or you can immediately jump in granular. and turn everything off. And that's huge because how many settings, how many notifications do you get? And it's like, I don't want to see this, but I don't even know where to look to shut this off. Yeah. Or even if you know, it's a huge list it's of apps. Dig, you gotta dig, dig, it's no dig. good. So I think that's actually going to be, in some ways, I think, notifications is worse for your mental health than using a phone a lot because notifications are taking you out of your life and yes. out of the real world and making you lose your train of thought because something buzzed. And yeah. if it's something stupid that They're just saying, buzzed hey, on your phone, hey, look at me. now hey, you can say, hey. or this fall when iOS 12 comes out, you'll be like, unsubscribe, just get me out of here, yep. and it's done. That's good. Uh, AR kit has been updated, and part of the update gives you this Memoji. It's funny that the after, right after the health and wellness, they announced, and now here's a new way it's to waste your some time. Some more addictive things. <laughs> My kids loved the Me feature on the Nintendo Wii. Yeah. They made like, 50 yeah. different Mies, yeah. uh, little, little avatars. Kids. Yeah, but you know, well, I, I mean, adults <laughs> like it too. But uh, this, I think it's going to be really popular, the idea that you can create your own Animoji. I think this is better than Snap's Bitmoji. I think it's better yeah. than Samsung's implementation. Well, Samsung it's like tried so to creepy. do machine learning on your yeah, face and creepy. stuff, where this is, it's like you're, it's yeah. using the design like cartoon. of emojis. It's the yeah. Apple's already existing emoji design, and then they provided kind of like a Mr. Potato Head right. collection of like thousands of little bits it's that fun. you can choose from. Yeah. It is really fun. And they did the smartest thing, because, you know, Animoji was kind of a flash 
flash in the pan. Don't tell Harry McCracken I said this. <laughs> but it was because all it really could do is send a little message or you could record it and post YouTube videos. And it's much more with the emojis and animojis, it's much more kind of like spread around the system now. You yeah. can do FaceTime with it. You can take really pictures annoy with people it. On your so conference you can calls. you can <laughs> annoy people everywhere with memoji and animoji now. Speaking of FaceTime, thirty two people. Yeah, that, that's kind of overkill. That's kind of bananas <laughs> to have 32 people. But we've been waiting for more than two people in a FaceTime call for so long that, you know what, I'm not going to turn them down when they say, how no. about 32? Nobody All right, will do fine. 32. I'll probably only do three or four, but right. 32. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, I th anything, oh, let's talk. You mentioned uh, the whole idea of workflow. So Apple bought yeah. a wonderful app. Called workflow. Uh, called workflow a couple of years ago that mm -hmm. allowed you to somewhat automate iOS, but because it's a third-party app, it can't automate everything. Right, and it was all based on the goodwill of app developers building it in. They used a hack to communicate with each other. Was which it is the URL? URLs, yeah. It was like the URL hack, so you could send a URL to a different app, and then it would do something and send you a URL. It was ridiculous, but it was amazing. It's, it's still the most powerful thing on iOS to do this stuff, and it really works pretty well given all those constraints. Then Apple buys them, and everybody's like, oh, Boy. Well, that was another good app that that is probably gonna we're never gonna see it again. And it's basically the best case scenario. It's instead of it disappearing, it's a core feature of Siri now called Siri Shortcuts. And because it's official, what it means is there's an official way for developers to opt in to this shortcut thing and basically say, here are the things my app can do and Love tell the this. system that. Love and then this. once you start doing it, you can actually go to the Siri settings and there's like a list. Here's all the stuff you've done recently. And you can say, I want to make a shortcut for that. And you can attach it to a Siri command. And you can go into the Siri Shortcuts app that's going to come out, which is basically Workflow. And you can build a whole stack of things to do at once. So, on, it looks a little like if this then that also. Yeah, that it's, a, it's actually a little more sophisticated because you can yeah. do variables and do branching and stuff. That. That so you it's can't really do. more like Automator. It is a lot like Automator. Um, and so the nerds are going to really go to town on it. It's going to be great because it's workflow for all of its power you know, Starbucks wasn't building a callback URL right. scheme for workflow, but is Starbucks going to build a order a drink yeah. series shortcut? Yeah, of even, course they are. Even if it's a mint mojito yeah, coffee, they're going to do it. Everybody's going to do it. Yeah. And then, so you're going to be able to say, hey, lady, um, I'm leaving the house and have it lock your smart lock, start your car, order your drink, tune to your radio station. It does station, have the risk, all though, of, those things. of the creepy factor because as they demonstrated, the Siri said, I see you're leaving home. Usually you have a mint mojito. It fills. Would I, should I order that for you? That's, I think, going to be, that's what Google does that's a so little creepy. It is a, yeah, the, and that, that's an extension of the Siri suggestions idea, but now Siri can suggest everything you do on your phone if it's got a, right. a Siri extension on it. Um, I think there's a messaging issue there. Apple does everything on their device, so it's not like Google knows. It's just literally your iPhone knows. Okay. But That's the fact so is bad. it has a creepy connotation. Yeah, Apple's doing all of this stuff on device. So only my phone knows I got a Phil's only and your, get a mint mojito. Only your day. iPhone knows. Thank God. No one else needs to know. <laughs> Thank God. But it's a, it's a very clever idea. The, the power here, I've, I've heard from some people who are like, oh, Siri, it, it, shortcuts, it's so boring. I, was, I wanted more AI stuff. It's like this reaches into the heart of every single app on your iPhone and gives you the power to set your own shortcuts, to stack those things together. And, to, and I think it's amazing. It's like a browser history for your iPhone. Yeah. Like literally you can go in and say, what are, the, what are the things I've done lately? And then use those. It's pretty great. Plus, it will suggest things for you. It's actually an inspired way to make Siri useful. This has mm -hmm. always been the challenge for Apple. Is that Siri's been too dumb because it's not willing to collect the information it needs to make it smarter. And you can't teach it, so you're completely reliant on the AI to do this. And they've tried to get Siri to mean more than just the voice AI with some success, but not a lot. And with this, like whoever in the Siri team said, you know what we should it's do is buy move. workflow yeah. and make this an official part of smart the system, move. incredibly smart because this thing is going to change how people use their iPhones. And I think Apple has enough clout in the marketplace and enough uh, big enough installed base. They mentioned one billion active phones in the world mm -hmm. that there will be plenty of incentive for developers to add these capabilities to yeah. their apps. I mean, seriously, if you're Starbucks, do you, you want do, do you want a Siri command yeah. that, that drives people to yeah. your app? Uh, yeah, I do. I do now, want that. So everybody will adopt it. And my understanding is it's also really easy because it's using a lot of the same stuff that was in like share extensions and some other things that are already in there. So for the most basic use of this, it's kind of like a line or two of code. It's an Xcode switch. And then you can do super <coughs> complex ones if you want to. I am a little... You, you said something that Apple has been promoting 
the idea that it's all done on phone. But mm -hmm. I have to say, when I was looking at the actual verbiage on the screen and as they were talking, they implied that the phone was doing a lot of it, but it's clear that it's not all on the phone. And this is where I want you to put your detective hat on. Okay, what do you think is not being done papers. on the phone? Well, for, well, I can tell you right now that if it's going out and getting weather surf reports, ordering coffee, all of that sure. stuff is off the phone. Yes. So if it were to be aggregated somewhere, yes. that would actually create a fairly detailed profile about you Right. If, off the if, phone. if the people who have the apps that you're using shared their data together. My guess, though, is it's going through Apple. That will no. be interesting to see. No, that's all. That's Are you all, sure? Because the notifications the have to go through Apple for notifications, for pingbacks. So, uh, yeah, but I don't think that Apple is looking at those. This is why I want you to look at right. this. Because I think they weaseled it a little bit in their announcements on stage. They didn't say it all happens on your phone. Okay, I'll look into it. So I want you to look into that because my feeling is that in order for this to really work, some of this is going to well, have to be server right. side. There's data. I don't think data is being processed on servers. I do think data is being transferred to app developers through Apple's push through notification Apple. servers. Yeah. But I don't think things like analyzing your behavior and that you use a particular app at a particular time is doing anything that's off the device. Okay. And it's the same thing as what we said about Microsoft spending $7 billion, which is Apple basically has put... They're all in on on device and privacy and security. So if they're really fuzzy about this and they're actually cheating, they're going to get in a world of trouble. I don't think they're cheating. <laughs> I think that it's a subtle, fine difference. For instance, Apple it did announce this week they're going to launch an ad platform. Now, there's no way an ad platform works without tracking. Another ad platform? Yeah. Remember, they failed with iAd, yeah. which would have had to have tracking. And so once that failed, Apple was very happy to say, see, we don't want to track you. But now they've launched a new platform and I'm wondering, see, the problem is there's so much commercial incentive for them to do some of these things. If they could find a way, and what they'll say, and you watch, oh well, yeah, we track, but, but we anonymize. Yeah. It's different. Sure, We cut the head off of it. We don't know what you're up to. And I, I think we need to keep their feet to the fire because we do want a private yeah. platform. I mean, and if you're going to sell yourself as a private platform, you, you better do imagine it. Imagine if all of the platforms we choose to use other than maybe Linux are all compromised in terms of all of our privacy. That would be... My that suspicion is, not a, is... That is not a world I want to live in. You're already living in it. I don't know about that. I think... I, we'll see. We'll see. I think we'll Apple has see. every financial incentive to not do that. I think Paul Manafort's going, but wait, those WhatsApp messages were encrypted. Did you see one of the changes in iOS 12 is all of those tools that they use to break into phones of they did break suspects those. Yeah. are broken because yeah. after like an hour, yeah. USB access you turns off. You can't plug in a USB a cell bright thingy device like two weeks and later. get all the information yeah. off. That's that I have to say. That's when Apple does those kinds of things. That makes me feel good. They're, in terms of privacy, we can debate it. In terms of security, they are real sticklers. They oh, have, no, there's no they have done a 180 from where they were 10 right. years ago on security. But just when you upload stuff to iCloud, just remember. They might give it to somebody. You never know. <laughs> uh, all right, that's enough of that. We covered, I think we covered in great detail we everything. It. We killed it. I don't think there's much else out there we could talk about. But there is another planet out there. And we're going to go visit Mars mm. in just a little bit. I like it. Astrobiologist. Did you know there was even a, a, a discipline called astrobiology? It there used is. to be really theoretical. It is not so theoretical not so, anymore. It's not so theoretical anymore. Yeah. But first a word from our fine sponsor, Rocket Mortgage. The best mortgage lender in the country. Number one in customer satisfaction year after year after year. Number one for primary mortgage origination since 2010. Number one for mortgage servicing since 2014, according to J.D. Power. Highest in customer satisfaction. And now they've gone up a notch in my book because they've created an entirely online mortgage approval process. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. When you're ready to buy or ready to refi, don't go to the bank and get a big stack of paperwork you got to fill out and go to the attic to find your pay stubs and your bank statements. That's the old school way of doing it. You can do it all on your phone. Answer a few simple questions. Quicken Loans has relationships with all the big financial institutions so they can get the information you need. They need with your permission. You don't have to go to the attic. They'll go to the attic for you in effect. And based on your income, your assets, your credit, they can crunch the numbers and tell you all the loans you qualify for. You choose the term, you choose the rate, you choose the down payment, you get the loan. And all of this happened 
in minutes, in minutes, in minutes, less time than it took to go to the bank. You could do this on your phone in under 10 minutes in most cases. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. They're an equal housing lender. They're licensed in all 50 states. And MLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. Rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. When it's time to buy or time to refi, apply for a loan in minutes at rocketmortgage.com slash NSS. Welcome back to the new screensavers. Jason Snell, Leo Laporte, and I am thrilled. I am so excited to get... Uh, astrobiologist Jen Eigenbrod on the line. She is with NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where they made an amazing discovery this week. Jen, welcome to the new screensaver. It's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Did you? I have to ask though. Astro, okay, space, mm -hmm. biology. Until now, that really didn't mean a lot. You mean until the other day? Yeah, I mean. We, going, oh, what, okay, well. Um, I mean, there's no biology on the moon. There's no biology. We didn't know about biology out there. Is there or is there? Is this, not, is this not something new? We don't know. We don't know. We really don't know. Yeah. Uh, there could be life on other planets. Uh, we could be life beyond our solar system. Yeah, but could be those is are, a big. Those are big questions. A big could be, right? And I know we're interested. It is. We want to well, find it. Here's, here's the interesting thing. Uh, when I first got into astrobiology, I think most graduate students at that time would have said, uh, no, there's probably not life out there. And then within a few years of being in graduate school, I remember asking a class of about 200 undergraduates what they thought about life elsewhere in the solar system. And every single one of them thought that we probably had life elsewhere. And so the, our perception of life elsewhere has changed dramatically over only a few years. I mean, this is 20 years ago. Right. But, um, but we haven't had a lot of evidence until recently. It feels like it's been the last 20 years that there's been this sort of drumbeat of evidence of water on Mars and of potential signs that there might have been life on Mars. Um, is That's it fair correct. to say this is sort of the latest and maybe the biggest little signal that we've gotten about the possibility? I think every little bit counts as something significant because if we didn't have all of those other bits, we probably wouldn't have done it in the first place. So we did the follow the water um, we, we found out some evidence with the first uh, rovers that the Pathfinder found some stuff. And then, of course, Curiosity really expanded upon that when it discovered there had been lakes in the Gale Crater around three and a half billion years ago. That's a pretty significant discovery because it tells us that uh, there was sustained water uh, at the surface during that time period. What's crazy about that is that that lake could have been around for hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years. That's a long time. And it's such a sharp contrast to what we have today on that dusty red planet. It's, it seems bone dry, yeah. except for a few seeps of water coming out of the ground in places. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, yeah the, so there's Gale Crater. Is the idea that by finding organic material in the crater, is the idea that that's a, maybe potentially a lake bottom that might've had some stuff that drifted down there? Yeah, so imagine um, having stuff coming in by rivers. We also have uh, lakes, I'm um, sorry, we have um, windblown material coming in. And perhaps in the water, life was living. Wow. And we don't know if that was the case or not, but we have discovered all of the essential ingredients to support life there. So Even if life wasn't there, it you know it, our concept of it is that it could have been happy being there. It We're doesn't mean that it was. Yeah. So what what you know, was what did you find this week? We found organic matter in the rocks. Okay. So those same exact rocks that we just talked about, you know, coming in from river, like all those sediments coming in from rivers or windblown stuff or stuff in the lake, all of it gets deposited at the bottom of the lake, and those become the rocks that uh, get buried at depth for a while, and then three some three and a half billion years later, uh, they've been excavated by erosion, and lo and behold, here comes Curiosity rover and drills into one of those. Wow. And the Curiosity rover drilled in, and uh, we took that sample and we heated it up and produce gases. And then we analyze those gases. And what we discovered was a set of molecules that were coming off the sample at high temperature. And 
it was a diversity of molecules, more than what we had ever detected on Mars before. And But because they were coming up at high temperature, they tell us that they're actually coming from something much bigger inside the sediment, something like a gigantic, what we call a macro molecule. So imagine having, there you go, we, we heat up the sample, there go to gases, they go into our instrument. We call this instrument SAM, it's the uh, sample analysis at Mars. The gases get ionized by an electron stream and then they off they go, they, they hear the molecules, they turn into fragments and then our detector de actually tells us the mass of those fragments. And from that, we can tell what the original gas was. And but because we see different chemicals in this gas at high temperatures, it tells us we have these large molecules in the sample itself. And those large molecules are more consistent with what we expect of almost every natural sample that we have ever come across. So you can think of um, here, you got small, these are the small compounds. That's the really big one there, the carrageen type compound. So the carrogen is broken down into propane, sulfur, benzene, That's that kind of right. thing. That's right. Okay. That's right. So the SAM instrument is only detecting the little bits and pieces that are plucked right. off of that larger molecule. Was, this, was SAM designed to do specifically this? Yes. So you almost expected to find this. We were hopeful for a long time. <laughs> it, it was uh, three years. Wow. Let's see, it was, uh, yeah, about three years into the mission when we came across the sample that, that gave us the information that and, we needed. And to all, really this, all this time, Curiosity has been drilling holes, getting samples, putting them in SAM, and nothing. Well, I wouldn't say nothing. We've, we've learned quite a bit about the rocks and about what that lake was like. But no but organic we, uh, chemicals. Well, we did have we did identify some organic molecules earlier in the mission, but um, there was only a few of them, and they were kind of odd in their chemistry, and we uh. weren't quite sure what to make of those. This time around, the molecules fit what we expected. Interesting. If you were to take um, an ancient lake sediment from Earth and analyze it the same thing as Sam, you'd see something similar. Interesting. If you were to look at meteorites, for instance, that have lots of organic matter in them, you'd see something similar. Uh, and then we, we even analyzed a Martian meteorite that has organic material in it that we think is coming from geological processes only, a very non-biological form that's unusual for Earth, but perhaps more common on Mars. And we even saw the same types of signals. And so it's great that what we saw on Mars is consistent with natural samples but at the same time, we can't tell what the source of it is because it matches all three possibilities. Right. So it could be, in fact, a meteor deposited it there. It could be. In fact, there are these tiny little dust particles we call interplanetary dust particles that are essentially raining down uh. onto the surface of Mars all the time. We have them raining down on Earth too, but we just don't notice them as much. But on Mars, uh, they're raining down all the time. They probably have for the history of the planet. And those could accumulate over time, especially in something like a giant giant lake in a crater um, that's been around for uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Now, there was also a discovery about methane and seasonality. What does that tell us? Yeah, so methane is a modern chemical in the atmosphere of Mars. And uh, there's been various folks who have been trying to make measurements of it from different techniques. And SAM is part of um, the, it's is sitting in the rover body in the belly, and it actually sniffs the atmosphere of Mars. Well, this is one of the uh, nominal experiments that we do on Mars on a re regular cadence. There you go, there's the SAM, the inlet. and what we do is uh, we've been doing this, I don't know, maybe a couple times a year. And we started to realize that, hey, the value that we're getting from methane is changing. It's seasonal. It took, it took three Mars years. Right. Look That's actually that. six Earth years. Wow. And we actually started realizing, hey, there's a seasonal cycle here. So the amount of uh, methane goes up during the summer and then by winter it's kind of falling down and, and dropping to a low point. And uh, why is this? Well, 
we honestly don't know. We don't know what the source of the methane is, but we can speculate about it using models and stuff to try and understand a little bit more uh, where it might be coming from. Uh, now, what's kind of uh, serendipitous is that we also are reporting this organic material in the rocks. And so one of the ideas is that organic material in rocks in general at depth is going through processes in the subsurface. And eventually that makes its way to the atmosphere. And perhaps uh -huh. there's something on a seasonal basis that's regulating how much gets released into the atmosphere. We just don't know those particulars yet. But um, there are lots of ideas floating around already, and I'm sure that uh, after the announcement yesterday, there will be a lot more people coming up with ideas to help explain it. <laughs> when you got the first data back with these uh, organic compounds, how is it exciting, or is it like, does it take a while to sink in, or what, is the, what does it look like? Oh, I think we need to back up a moment. Um, the uh, data comes down from Sam, and then we go through a process of trying to understand what that is. And uh, we received the data probably back in uh, or late winter, 2015. Whoa! Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not overnight. <laughs> Scientists yeah, are patient. About, it took me about six months to go through uh, initial processing of that. <laughs> so it's not an overnight response. Yeah, yeah. It, it it actually took quite a bit of time. And then when we finally, when I finally got some inkling, hey, I think there's something here, talk about with the team, you know, a few other people kind of come up with some things that they want to look more specifically for. Uh, we went back and looked at it more closely. Are you real and cautious though, Jen? You go, well, this could be something. I don't want to get too excited. Yeah, you can't when you're talking about something this big. <laughs> uh, we've been looking for organic molecules on Mars since Viking landed in wow. 1976. Wow. Uh, so if you're going to make an announcement like this, you really need to be sure that you, the data says what you think it is. Wow. So uh, we went through a couple iterations of processing the data to make sure that it was what we think it was, make sure that um, the signals were actually repeatable. We found them in two different samples and we didn't find them in all the other samples that we had uh, looked at more carefully. So. Here, here, here you go. Here's uh, one of those examples. We've got thiophene. It's uh, four carbons there, and, a, and the yellow one is the sulfur. And that's a really important compound that we identified, and uh, because the sulfur in there is partly responsible for making those giant macro molecules, and we we find sulfur in organics all the time. So um, at least on Earth we do. So these. It, it, it took a long time. It wasn't like an instantaneous, oh my gosh, there's something here. It was, no, you're looking at the data, you're looking at the data, you're looking at the data. And it took for several months before I got that aha moment and I re realized that we were really on to something and uh, we just needed to be sure. So that's why it took three years to get this, this work out. So where do we go from here? I know Mars Insight is on its way and it's got some tools that let it dig way down. Is it going to be able to help perhaps um, further the knowledge that, that uh, you reported this week? Is it, is it going to help in that way? Well, Mars Insight is actually um, looking at the ge geology, uh, the, the dynamics of the planet itself. Are there Mars quakes? That's something that's going to explore. It wants to know, is the geology, um, is the rocks, are they, is, is the planet itself actually dynamic in at the current status? Is it actually doing things? Is it moving? You know, we have um, seismometers that we work with. Uh, we have different types of ground measurements that we do to try and understand some of that kind of stuff here on Earth. And uh, Insight is one of those first instruments, packages that's really going to try and understand what the uh, what the inside of the planet is doing. We haven't had a chance to really explore that before. But it's not going to be yeah. able to do the level of analysis of the of the material that you were able to do. No, uh, there is there are two other missions that are relevant. Uh, Insight is actually a very different type of mission, important in its own right, but a very different type of science. Uh, the missions that are really a follow up to Curiosity rover are going to be the European Space Agency's ExoMars rover. And that one has a drill on it that goes two meters down. 
that one's going to be exciting. <laughs> I really, really can't wait for results from that um, because uh, what's important about the curiosity of results that ExoMars is going to help resolve is the influence of the radiation environment at the surface. Now, we're familiar with radiation uh, a little bit from our own exposures and our own lives. However, on Mars, there's a significant amount of radiation, more than we can even mimic here on Earth, really. So uh, that radiation is generating free radicals all the time and really harsh chemicals we call oxidants. And all of that stuff can break down organic material and including the stuff that we actually found. So what we found in Curiosity Crater I'm sorry, what we found in the Gale Crater by Curiosity is actually um, already been altered by that radiation mm -hmm. to some degree. Mm -hmm. And yet we still found it. And that was a surprise to a lot of people because it could have been destroyed by the radiation. But since we did find it there, it probably means that deeper down, there are other organics that are better preserved. And that's the type of stuff that ExoMars rover is going to get to look at. There's also the NASA Mars 2020 rover that is going to go to probably a different type of environment. There you go. Different, there's, they're, they're really cool looking rovers, I have to say. These are so fun. exciting, these <laughs> things. It's so exciting. So the Mars 2020 rover has a, it looks kind of like Curiosity. Um, it has the same uh, rover body, but it has a completely different set of instruments on board. And um, it's going to be able to look at the sediments and the minerals and, and how organic material is inside that rock a little bit differently. And hopefully it will um, be able to pick out some samples to put in little tubes, leave on the ground. And some day later, we are going to, we're, we're planning on sending uh, a, a, a cache, a, 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 another real rover will go by and pick up those little caches and uh, send them home. And we're gonna get them back at earth. So that's that's being planned right now. That that hasn't happened yet, but it's being planned. The only Martian rocks we have on Earth right now are in the form of meteorites. So it might be kind of nice to have uh, rocks from yeah. Mars delivered to us, the ones that we chose, and then we could use our own analytical packages at home and in various labs around the world to look at those and and see if there's actually any indications of life in those rocks. Um, so. Between the two uh, rovers, both of them have the potential of really shedding a lot of light on things. But I kind of think that the ExoMars rover, um, because of its deep drilling capacity, it's very unique. And uh, it might be able, it has an instrument on board that might actually detect signs of life. And uh, that's just going to be really exciting. Wow. I think we should all be on our edge of our seats waiting for that one. What, when will that be? Well, it launches in 2020, yeah. and so you figure it takes eight months, eight and a half months for it to get there. Um, it's going to have um, about 120 days of its normal mission, so we're probably going to see results in 2022. We'll call you That's then. That's my guess. <laughs> yeah, 2021, 2022. <laughs> you have an exciting job. I don't know when you originally created the title astrobiologist, you knew it'd be this exciting, but I think this is probably what you were hoping for. Oh, it, it, I have to say, I do love my job. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to uh, find other people who find get are as excited about it as I am. <laughs> Jen uh, Eigenbrode is a uh, astrobiologist at the, I love it, at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Thank you so much. I know this was, you've done more than three dozen interviews <laughs> this week <laughs> on this uh, organic material, but um, we're so glad you could uh, take some time on a Saturday to talk to us. Well, Thank thanks you. for having me. Thanks, Jen. Thanks. Take care. Right. Coming up uh, in just a little bit, we're going to review the planet, nicely named computers, Gemini PDA. But first, Jason Howell, how do you like that, has a review of the Lenovo Mirage. Remember when VR started making waves just a couple of years ago and everyone was talking about how cool it would be to watch a movie in 360 degrees? Did you ever actually try that? It's kind of not awesome. The action can literally take place anywhere around you. You don't know where to look. You spend all of your time rotating all around. It's not passive in any sense. So a while back, Google announced a new video format called VR 180. It's meant to be an easy entryway into creating content that's perfect for viewing in VR by cutting the field of view in half. Instead of looking for that thing behind you, everything's positioned in front of you. And because that fixed location, it makes it easier to include stereo imaging with two cameras, which is exactly what the VR 180 spec is all about. Enter Lenovo. Last week, 
I reviewed this, Lenovo's new Mirage Solo with Daydream standalone VR viewer. And this week, I'm taking a look at this. This is the Mirage camera, which looks a lot like a point and shoot actually, but with eyes. That's because the two fisheye lenses on the front are designed to capture stereoscopic photos and videos that can be viewed inside of your VR viewer of choice. I'm sure Lenovo hopes that it's theirs. First, let's pick apart the hardware. The dual 13 megapixel f2.1 aperture lenses combine to make a single 180 degree stereoscopic still image, as well as up to 4K video resolution, including electronic image stabilization. However, you won't find a viewfinder on the camera itself to test the framing. There's none on here. You're going to need a phone running Google's VR 180 app to see the preview feed from the camera. More on that in a second. The camera has three buttons on top, power, shutter, and this F button that actually changes the function of the device. This is how you cycle between shooting still images and video. Live streaming via Wi-Fi is an option as well, but that must be selected from the app on the phone. Now, when the camera is on, blue illumination indicates the modes since, well, there's no screen to put that mode information onto. So, you know you're connected to Wi-Fi up top and then on the back, you know which shooting mode you're currently on. You can actually open the flap next to the mode display and in there you have USB-C charging port, which is nice, and a micro SD card slot for expansion of up to 128 gigs of additional storage beyond the 16 gigs of internal storage. And then down below, a standard tripod screw for all of your mounting accessories. You can also slide this panel to access the removable 2200 milliamp hour battery, which holds around two hours worth of use. All in all, the Mirage camera is compact. It's lighter than you'd expect, maybe even a little hollow to the touch. Inside, it's packing a Snapdragon 626 processor with two gigs of RAM. Now, as I said before, you do need the software on a phone if you wish to check out the preview. The app itself is pretty basic, but it does the trick. There you have access to basic information such as battery and storage that's remaining on your camera. But more importantly, you have access to previously shot footage complete with a cardboard button if you wanna view this on a low rent setup, as well as to connect to the camera for a live, if not slightly delayed feed of what it sees in real time with the option to then take pictures, record video, and even stream directly to your YouTube account in a matter of seconds from the app. Most of this can be done from the camera actually without the need for the app running, but then you won't know what you're shooting until it's too late, so be forewarned. As for the quality of the content, it's easy to hear 4K and think that the video quality is gonna be sharp as a knife. The reality is that while the image quality is acceptable, depending on your source material, you're gonna get wildly different output. Keeping the camera in a fixed position, I found, helps to improve the image of both stills and video quality, and also makes you a little less seasick when you're in a VR viewer. Bright light sources will not really balance very well with darker, more shadowy parts of the image. That's thanks to a lack of HDR, and of course, the f2.1 aperture isn't doing any favors here either. Also, due to the fisheye lenses, if the object gets a little too close to the camera, it makes for a challenging view in VR. You might need to cross your eyes a little bit. And if it's at all windy outside, you get some nasty audio artifacts uh, from the unguarded onboard microphones. Now, the live streaming to YouTube is a unique feature here. It does require a connected phone, as that's the conduit for the stream, which is a little bit of a bummer, and you must have a verified YouTube account to actually stream publicly, which by the way is easily done. You just head over to youtube.com slash verify and you can kick off the process. This might be the perfect extra feature for say famous YouTubers, rabid hardcore audiences that want more content from their favorite creators. Going live is undoubtedly way easier than a long edit process after all. And 3D content is a nice added bonus for fans who care. In the end, the Mirage camera, I'd say serves its purpose. It's a quick and easy to use camera for shooting palatable 3D pics and video with minimal fuss. The quality is perhaps not as polished as it could be, but you're kind of trading convenience for quality to a certain degree. After all, the camera is $299.99. And that's actually, believe it or not, pretty inexpensive when you compare it to the ginormous and complicated other 3D cameras out there that have been around for a while. The Lenovo Mirage camera is the first to support the VR 180 format. And I have no doubt that future offerings are going to continue to offer more competitive features. It's an immersive format. It definitely deserves more time and attention.
I'm Jason Howell. Find me on All About Android, Tech News Weekly, Triangulation, and a whole bunch of other shows, including the new screensavers here on Twitter. Thank you, Jason. It kind of makes sense. You know, I have a, one of the GoPro Fusions 360-degree mm -hmm. cameras, and most of the time, you don't want to see what's behind. You want right. to see, you'd like to see wi a wide angle of this, but you don't need to see what's behind. So it makes sense. It only shoots forward in stereo. All right, review number two. Did you, were you, did you ever have a Scion? No, no. I had a Scion 3A that I just loved. It was about the size of a glasses case. It had a kind of a keyboard, a full-size-ish keyboard. It had its own dedicated operating system. This was back in the day, so mm -hmm. it was, uh, I think it was, uh, it was green screen or gray on green or something like that. <laughs> I contrast. <clears throat> Scion followed up with something they called the Scion 5, which had the same kind of Scion, uh, here's a picture of it, the same kind of Scion interface. You see those menu icons at the bottom, those are kind of hard-coded onto the screen. And I like the keyboard, it's like a full travel keyboard. Never did own a Scion 5 because it was a lot more expensive and not quite more functional. I love my Scion 3A. Then along comes a, a company, an English company called Planet Computers, and they offered this on Indiegogo. They called it the Gemini PDA. They said, basically, we can make now a Scion 5 type digital assistant, but instead of putting this proprietary operating system on, we're going to put Android on it, or Linux, and it's going to be less than a, a high-end Android phone. It's going to have that keyboard, and the Gemini was born. When I saw it, I said, oh, I, I got to get that. That's like the Scion is back. And it is. If you hold it like this, it is kind of like an Android phone. It's not much smaller than... Uh, than a regular phone. This is an iPhone with a case. It's a smaller than a, bigger than an iPhone, but it's about the size of a Google Pixel 2 XL. You can actually use it as a phone. I, there's microphone and speakers. In fact, it even auto senses which side is up, and will. And you can actually. Do I look a little silly? Looking really fancy. <laughs> But you can actually talk on the phone like this. You can also use it as a speakerphone or as a Skype phone. So there are a couple of differences between this and an Android phone. First of all, there's no outward-facing camera. But there is a camera in here, which makes it a good choice for using with Skype or some other video program. You see, you saw that briefly. It does have the dock bar, but it's software-based, and you can slide it up and down. If you look at this, it actually is just Android. Not the latest, I'm sad to say. It's Android 7.1.1. I would rather see Android 8. Uh, maybe they'll update it with Android 8, but for now it's 7.1. This is their uh, launcher, which I think is a pretty stock uh, Google-style launcher. <clears throat> when you see it with, you know, things like the Photos app, you realize, well, you know what? This is pretty cool because these 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 photos look pretty good. It's a it's a very good screen, and and the quality of the images is actually pretty strong. Having a touch screen on here makes this a I don't know a fairly compelling uh, product. Uh, you can also do many of the things you do on Android. I even have an SSH tool on here so I can log into my server. And because of the aspect ratio and the real keyboard, it's actually much more usable than trying to use a smartphone to log onto a server and type in terminal commands. <clears throat> the speakers aren't great. In fact, let me, I'll play a, uh, an audible Without book on here. You can see it's a little tinny. It's certainly not something you'd want to listen to music on. It just doesn't have that that base. And you'll have to, in some cases, some apps, this is Apple Music, are not they really savvy. Really they're not want hip. You to be in portrait, they're huh? not hip to the landscape mode orientation of this phone. A surprising number of apps are. In fact, all the Google apps work uh, pretty well. Here's my email program. It works just fine. It says, oh, yeah, I recognize that you're in landscape mode. I showed you uh, Google Photos. Chrome works just like a real browser. Um, that's that's kind of great. Uh, there is uh, haptic feedback, so when I touch the screen, I kind of know I've touched the screen. Maps is actually a really good example of how a screen like this could be pretty useful uh, because you get a little bit more real estate this way. The keyboard is actually very usable. I feel like I could type on this better than I can on my MacBook. But you know mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of the MacBook keyboard. There certainly is a lot more travel. I had they, a foldable keyboard for the Palm 3, It's similar to say. that. It's similar and to it that. And it was similar, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's pretty good travel. There's haptic feedback, so you, you can turn that on or off. But there's haptic feedback, so you know when you've hit a key. They've got a lot of specialty keys, the function key, the alt key. And you can see that if I want to make a phone call, if I press function 
and that key, it'll launch the phone app. Yes, this makes phone, here's my mom. This makes phone calls. I put a T-Mobile SIM in this, so it has data and phone calls. You could use any GSM SIM in here. I don't think it works with Sprint and, uh, and Verizon very well. So they do say they're going to put Linux OS on here, that it's going to be dual boot if you want. Linux would be very interesting on this, but Android works you know, pretty well. It's, this is the same problem that Android's had with a lot of tablet-style uh, interfaces. They're just not super uh, savvy about that, but there's Google News. It works fine. The images are good. It's text is big and readable. That's not bad. It's not a very fast processor in here. It's a MediaTek MT6797X. Don't even know what that means. A DecaCore uh, Helio X27. It's an ARM processor. It's not a Snapdragon. It's a MediaTek. Uh, but it feels fairly snappy, and uh, I haven't noticed any issues or lag. It doesn't have a huge amount of RAM, just 4 gigs of RAM. 64 gig internal storage, but you can't put an SD card in here. And it does the, it looks like it's doing adopted storage, which means when you put the SD card in here, it adds the internal to the SD card and gets a total size. You don't have to say this is internal, this is external. It handles that very nicely. Quad core uh, ARM Mali T880 GPU, that's probably why it's fairly snappy. It has 4G. They call it 4G. I think that's because it's European. I'm sure it's really LTE. In fact, I am getting voice over LTE using my uh, T-Mobile SIM in here, which is nice. Large battery, 4220 milliamp hour battery. They claim two weeks on standby, 12 hours of talk time. Uh, I found it went at least a day and a half without charging. And by the way, Type-C charging, which is really nice. It has a headphone jack, might as well, when you get something this large. A Type-C port on this side, that's charging. And then this is the Type-C data port. It also has an on-off switch. I'm not sure why, because it comes alive pretty quickly when you open it up. You don't need to really turn it on or off. <clears throat> the dual speakers, as I mentioned, a little bit tinny. Um, it has an uh, integrated voice assistant button if you want to launch your voice assistant. Unca oddly enough, it has its own Gemini voice assistant. I haven't really played with that since Google Assistant's on here. That's more than adequate for me. This camera is 5 megapixels, but it's only forward-facing. There's no back-facing. But it, I tried it with Skype, and it works very nicely. So all in all, I have to say, for the price, which is $500 without LTE data, uh, five nine. So you just use it with Wi-Fi. Five, uh, five ninety-nine, a hundred bucks more if you want to use 4G, and I think you will. So six hundred dollars for what is effectively a high-end Android flagship phone with a few quirks and a very nice keyboard. I like this. I've been using it a lot. So where do you use it? In bed. Traveling on a train, on a plane. Um, it, I don't know if you'd want to watch movies on it. It's kind of a uh, wide aspect ratio on the side, but you could. It's a good enough screen to do that. I think it's more, to me, this is more like if I want to do email, if I want to do something where the keyboard is going to be more right. important. It's a little PC. This is basically a little PC. That's, ex that's, I think, the best way to think about it. This is the Planet Computer's Gemini PDA. And I, I think a lot of people laugh at me when I pull this out of my pocket, but this actually could be your full time phone and have a little bit more with that nice keyboard built in. Are you ready? It's time for a call for help. <laughs> On the line with us right now from Cardi, Missouri, Don. Hello, Don. Hi, Leo. Hi, you, Jason. You've been here for oh, a while. Yeah. Thank you for being so patient. I'm sorry we took so long to get to you. Yeah, hey, just how it works out. We appreciate it. What can I do for you? What can we do for well, you? Well, I'm a uh, old time Apple user and I've been using uh, Apple Works and then Claris Works to build a database of motorcycle uh, part catalogs that I've scanned in an OCR. And then I started using FileMaker. And I haven't used FileMaker in a few years now. And I want to start working on my database again. But FileMaker crashes now. And I don't want to uh, pay the $500 charge to uh, upgrade. So I'm looking for a simple flat file database. Te the, text only, or do you have images as well? Uh, just text. So I'm going to do my weird thing up front here, which is <laughs> you can emulate <laughs> Mac OS 10.7 up, like Lion and Mountain Lion and all of that. So you could just download VirtualBox and install Mac o an old version of Mac OS in it. Can you it. do that, really? Yeah. So you're running at your Mac, you know, the current Mac Mojave or Sierra or whatever, and you could put uh, VirtualBox, which is free yeah. from Oracle, 
on there. And then when you launch it, you can say install Mac OS. Install, on Mac hardware, you can do that. It's it's allowed for OS uh, 10.7 and forward. So you could go back. You'd probably want to go back that far. It sounds yeah. Like. And then and then put FileMaker on there. Now that's not going to be the greatest the greatest thing in the world. It's going to be super fast. It, it's not going to be super fast. It's not going to be it, awful. But but no, it will probably be okay. It's running on Intel hardware. How big okay. is your database? Well, it can't. Anywhere from, uh, well, 140,000 files. Okay, it's large. Yeah. Well, that it's knocks out a bunch of those parts. free <laughs> web databases that are out there because they all limit you pretty severely. And Don threw us at a curve because not only does he want to use it on a Mac, he wants to use it uh, at flea markets on an iPad, right, Don? Correct. And you don't have connectivity out there, so the database would have to live on the iPad. Correct. <laughs> now it gets complicated because that you can't use your virtual box solution because that won't run on an iPad. Exactly will it? right. Yeah. No. Um, he, he wants to be a, like a modern person who has a an iPad. I, I don't blame him. That's a good one. <laughs> Probably want to do that. So, I guess what we want to look at is what is the state of the art for databases on iOS. Now, the first thing I thought of isn't going to be a great solution because it needs connectivity, and that's the Zoho Creator. Zoho is a office online office suite, kind of like uh, Google's office suite. I like it a lot. It's very powerful. It's not free uh, for a database that size. You might be paying 20, 30, 40 bucks a month. Uh, and it's online only. So I don't think you can download it, but I really like Zoho. Zoho Creator, the reason it came to mind is as far as I can tell it's very similar to FileMaker. You know, one of the things people loved about FileMaker is it was very easy to create dedicated applications with forms mm -hmm. that had a great user interface and it connected up to the database behind the scenes. And as you can see, here we are generating uh, a form. It's very similar to FileMaker. You've got, you know, gadgets and buttons and stuff and it's, you hook them up, you connect them to the database. I just love how this works. And, uh, frankly, I've been looking at this as a, as a possible solution for an in-house app that we run at Twit, but, and it does run on the iPad, um, but I don't think it runs offline, and I think that's going to be, maybe it does, though, I'll have to look into it. It's also not cheap, and I think that may be one reason. They have a free tier, but not for 140,000 records. Let's see, how many records? So 20 bucks a month, that's not too bad. 20 bucks a month, um, but is, can it run offline? That's the real question. Um, so that's one thing I would look at. Uh, FileMaker, I guess, is too expensive. You don't want to upgrade FileMaker. Uh, that's five hundred dollars, and they it's do have really an overkill. <clears throat> they do have an iPad uh, application. Sure. Uh, how about Numbers? Yeah, I think one of the options here might be a spreadsheet that runs on iOS and Mac. That's how and you started, right? Uh, yeah, on on the. Uh, I'd scan it in and clean everything up in the uh, spreadsheet sp spreadsheet uh, in Apple Works, and then uh, move it over to the database. So, <clears throat> I mean, there's a fine line between what a database and a, a, a spreadsheet, and a spreadsheet isn't is so different as a, than a flat file database. No, it's right? not that different. And and uh, most of these um, apps, Google Sheets, not so much. But like Numbers has a whole relational lookup thing you can do you can compare so you could items you can summarize them. you could do fancy if you want <clears throat> um it's not maybe perfect but it's on the mac and think, it's on ios and you have it and you it's have free. it so i would first try that you could export your filemaker database uh, as a tab delimited or comma yeah. separated values csv file bring it right in import it into numbers uh, you can even make some pretty nice formatting in Numbers. Num one, of the, one of the nice things about Numbers is one of the prettiest spreadsheet programs out there. Yeah, that's what I do. I've actually got it right here. I got oh. This is all my charts for six colors. Is that how you do your that, your great charts? This is how I do it all is in Numbers. because I didn't know that. Because the charting is pretty. It's the, the best uh, for This that. is one of the best features of six colors. When they're the Apple quarterly results yeah, come I out, just I got immediately a, I, go I just there. got a giant number spreadsheet on that. my Mac or my iPad that I can do and, and uh, generate some nice. So, yeah, I mean, it, it can be done. It can be done, it, it, and you already have it. So, and getting a standalone database that will sync, but can be offline and can run on the Mac and iOS, that's a that is a tough one. Anything more than this is going to cost you. I uh, think so. I do think Zoho has offline capabilities. I don't know if it does on iOS. I'll have to I'll have to look at that and, and see. Um, what else is out there? It has to be basically to start with the iOS app. So there are iOS databases. Yeah, or or some other kind of like information collection app, I suppose. Um, you know, you mentioned DevonThink when we were talking I about love this Devin before Think, the show. It's it does probably have not an right. iOS 
uh, version as well as a desktop version. It's 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 it is a database, but it's a f kind of uh, hard to describe. It's more like an outliner. But it might be what you would need. It has very good search capabilities. That might be something to look at. DevonThink is very good. You can do a free trial of DevonThink, see if it'll do what you want. It probably would not, the free trial probably would not be able to handle 140,000 records. Yeah. Um, what but, do you do? So you put it in the spreadsheet. Why do you go past the spreadsheet into FileMaker? What is it that FileMaker adds to that? Uh, let's say I want to uh, look for a, a bearing off a generator. And I could uh, ask the, you know, put the, put that into a FileMaker, and it'll give me all the records that have. Uh, yeah, the reports basically is what you use. Correct. For. Yeah. Does, right. And you're searching numbers, in a specific field. Yeah. Numbers right. will let you find those fields, but I don't know if it. You could probably write a report in numbers. I bet you you could, because that's all that is. That's or, a report. Or Excel, honestly, would do yeah. that too, probably. I think I think you've you've kind of uh, stumped us. Oh, and we should see. Gray Raven says iOS numbers may have a sixty-five thousand uh, limit on rows. I wouldn't be surprised if there's would a limit. Would not shock me. Uh, that this would mean one hundred forty thousand records would be too many because each record. The sad right. face is the sad fact about all this is that um, consumer databases kind of don't exist. And so you found $500 for a FileMaker upgrade. That's really not a consumer product anymore. Right. FileMaker did Bento, which was a really nice consumer database. And they killed it because it apparently didn't work for their business model. And so we're left with a, a bunch of spreadsheets and a few cloud databases, um, which is the other option here. If you, if you have con connectivity, but you'd rather avoid it, that might be the way to do it is to, is to just kind of bite the bullet and, and use a cloud database on your phone or something. Yo, Jimbo. Do you remember that? Rich Siegel? Yeah, they still... Does but, he still do it? Yeah, but there's no uh, iOS, iOS version, version of iOS version of it. It's just desktop. No, it's iPad. Is it? Yeah, Yo, Jimbo. Um, you know, this might be it. We Yeah, go click that lower right hand... Oh, that's me. That's my computer. <laughs> Leo, <laughs> Leo, click, click that. that lower right hand corner. <coughs> oh, yeah, there it is. This is Rich Siegel, who's a great programmer. He does, of course, BB Edit, which is a must for anybody who works with text on a Mac. This looks like it Again, might do a lot of the It's kind same of things. unstructured is the challenge, because you want some <coughs> structure. And this is not, I mean, there are tags and stuff, but it's kind of a it's, document. This, this looks very similar in a way to Devon. To Devon, yeah. 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 Th so this is, I don't know, th this is, I wish there were consumer databases out there that were not cloud, but that's sort of where it is right now, is stuff like um, Zoho, or what was the other one that I was looking at? There's there's a there's a few out there. Panorama but, we were talking about. Which oh, yeah, yeah, Panorama, an like, ancient, like, ancient like FileMaker, database. Panorama also still exists, but again, it's one of those things where they're priced for enterprises who are invested in their databases and not for you, which is what we're looking for here. That's, That's what I'm finding puzzle. out by searching the web. There's not too much. Yeah. And yet, this is exactly what the iPad should be doing. This is kind of what I'm unhappy about in general, is this move towards commoditized consumer applications, not even really applications, apps, and, and means we're turning away from the power tools that desktop computing gave us. And that's why I hate seeing Apple port all the iOS apps to Macintosh, because it's just going to accelerate that movement. Now, you pointed out the movement's already there, but there's people like me and Don who want to use our computers as power tools. Mm -hmm. we, th that's a, pr a database is what computing was practically invented for. Why is it so hard to do this? In this modern age, I think we, I think you're stumped. I think we've the, given you some choices. I think the problem is it's a power user tool, and the companies that make them have decided that they can charge a fortune for them, and yeah. that there aren't enough people who are in where Don is, where you want to use it, but you don't have a budget for thousands of dollars a year, and so they basically tell you to run off and use a spreadsheet, which unfortunately is I think what we're saying is you might want to look into numbers get. and Excel and Google Sheets, probably not Google Sheets, and uh, and use that instead. I wish, uh, how, would you like to learn how to program? Uh, <laughs> I used to uh, use an Apple Soft Basic, but. All uh, right, see this, this begs really for a custom solution. And this is where, for instance, AppleScript 
or something like that. I wish we had some. I, do you have to use Swift to write something for uh, iOS? Yeah, I think you kind of do. Yeah, or, but or I, you know, I, I don't know. C. Numbers may have, and Excel may have, data filtering and things like I'd that. I'd start that with would do numbers. It. What you're really looking for is a report capability that can do a search and generate a simple page with the results separate from, and I bet you you could do that with numbers. Know. Maybe not, a little macro programming, yeah, that kind of thing. If not numbers. Then Excel for sure. Then Excel where you could at the very least filter out all the records that don't match. Right. And then you've got a list of records that do match. Right. I think it's a challenge for you, Don, but you, you know what? If you've, you've coded, you've been doing this for a long time, you know better than anybody. Uh, now, somebody's showing us a SQLite browser. SQLite oh is a, a built-in database system on most computers these days, certainly all Macs. I didn't know it was on iOS, but apparently it's on iOS well. Like can bundle well. it in the app, I think. Oh, maybe that's it. It's a very lightweight, uh, it's actually a relational database, but you could be easily used as a table database, mm -hmm. the kind you're doing. But then you're just, it's going to live on your iOS device You have to have a way point. to synchronize the data, yeah. It's a SQLite browser for iOS. Wow, isn't that interesting? This is pretty, look at that though, that's pretty primitive. No reporting capabilities, it just lets you see the data. Hmm. Yeah, this is, you found a hole in the software ecosystem. Yeah, you should write and it. And it's really mm -hmm. annoying. And so, Soho is the answer, right? Except the connectivity. It kills me that they killed Bento, because that's really what you want. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Father. Yeah, I knew da I knew databases were sort of a dying uh, programs, and uh, but why? The, databases are bigger. Be. They're bigger than ever, but they're not things that they feel like regular users want. Yeah, that's the problem. All right, there you go. That's a couple of things anyway for you to give it a try to, Don. I hope one of them works for you. Let us know, will you? Stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, yeah, if you Leo. find it's an really answer, nice we want to hear it. You. Yeah. Uh, boy, it just feels like that's that's a hole. That's something that should be written. Yeah. Somewhere, somehow. Bento. Everybody loved Bento. And it, Why did file? What happened? My, to my guess is that they had, um, they didn't sell a lot of them, and they were worried that it was siphoning interest off from their super yeah. expensive product. Yeah. It's too bad. Yeah. I used to use FileMaker all the time back when they had the cheap kind of consumer version. I but love again, FileMaker. all they have is FileMaker Unlimited now, and if you buy a new version, it's five hundred bucks. And yeah. it's too bad because uh, yeah, I still have FileMaker databases running in a virtual machine, Leo, in a virtual machine. See. You can do it. But you can't do that on your iPad. Not on your iPad. Thank you, Don. Next week, Jason Howell will be here, our Android guru. You want us to answer your tech questions? Mm -hmm. mm, easy. Jason Here's follows how. Jason. Jason and Jason. Need tech help? The new screensavers are here with answers. Email your tech questions to newscreensavers at twit.tv. And now, Megan Maroney, we're going to answer the mailbag questions in just a second. But first, Megan Maroney is going to show you how to clean up all those Amazon Echo recordings that Amazon's been saving all this time, Megan. A few weeks ago, Leo and I showed you how easy it is to accidentally send your recorded personal conversations to people in your contacts list. You might also be interested in knowing that Amazon makes a recording every time you summon your assistant and that recording is stored on your Alexa app. Here's how you can listen to those recordings and delete them. Open the Alexa app on your phone or tablet, tap the hamburger menu in the top right, tap settings, scroll down to history, then you can read the transcription of your interaction or tap the play button to hear what you sounded like. Echo, you are my best friend in the whole wide world. Delete it or keep it for posterity or for the FBI. According to Amazon, it may take 24 hours to complete your request to delete the audio file. You will notice that these recordings include your wake word, which means that the many microphones of the Amazon Echo are always listening to you. Echo, play all the show tunes. Hi. Hi. Now that doesn't mean that there are a bunch of Amazon employees sitting around replaying your most embarrassing conversations over and over again for laughs. But apparently, the device doesn't exactly wait for the wake word either. Echo, are our conversations private? I only send audio back to Amazon when I hear you say the wake word. For more information and to view Amazon's privacy notice, visit the help section of your Alexa app. Amazon uses these recordings to get better at understanding what you're saying. So if you delete them, you might find that your success with your Echo diminishes. However, some people have reported that wiping all of the conversations has actually helped Echo get better. 
If you want to help Amazon get better at understanding you, the same place you delete the comment is where you let them know whether Alexa knew what you meant or not. Now, if you want to delete all of your voice recordings, you have to do that from the Amazon website. Go to amazon.com and click accounts and lists. Under digital content and devices, click content and devices. Then click the your devices tab. Select your device and then click manage voice recordings. Then click delete. You have to do that for each and every device. So if you have as many Amazon Echoes as I do, this could take a while. Google will also record your conversations that you have with your assistant. To find and delete those, go to history.google.com and then browse or search for your audio recordings. I am Megan Maroney and I host iOS Today every Tuesday with Leo and Tech News Weekly every Thursday with Jason Howell. You can also find me on Twitter at Megan Maroney. Love you, Echo. I love you so much. Am I a good singer? Do I have a career in singing? I don't know that. <laughs> it's really embarrassing to listen back wow. to your Amazon Echo recordings. I don't recommend it. Uh, there, a lot of them end up swearing. Does Siri, yeah. can I listen to my Siri recordings? No. No, they but all we get, know that Apple saves them. They, they all get... They say they anonymize they, them. And I think they discard them. I think they're also recording the request and not the audio. Oh, okay. Um, it's weird. This is a very Amazon thing where Amazon's like, well, in order to make our system better, we'll save them and let you play them back later and tell us whether we got it right or not, which is very much like beta software feels like rather right. than like, at some point you should just be like, no, no. I think it's, we'll I, I don't, we'll I rarely do it, but if you get a lot of false positives or a lot of uh, incomprehensible results, it might be worth going through it. I have had that happen where I, where sure. I thought, what say the no. heck did I say yeah. Yeah. to make it tell me a story while I was watching <laughs> yeah. TV? Well, that's the other thing. I think it's always, because I, I have to say, I have all of them in my house. I've got a HomePod, I've got Echoes, I've got Google Assistants, I've even got a Cortana. And there's not a night goes by I'm watching TV that one of them doesn't perk up and say, yeah, what, huh, yeah, I can't help you with that. Yeah. So, I'm sorry. I can't do that right now. <laughs> the, I was listening to an audio book, and uh, on the audio book, uh, somebody said, seriously, what time is it? And Siri goes, 4.13. <laughs> That's my favorite. Oh, computers. It's time for the mailbag. Let's push it in here, Colleen. Here it is. Colleen Goldstein. It's the strangest shape bag ever. Colleen had a lovely ever. party uh, the other night to say goodbye. Was it last night? It was two nights yeah, ago. It was Thursday. Thursday night to say goodbye to, to Father Padre. Robert. Yeah. yeah, he's going back to Rome. I'm so glad you say it that way because you could say that he's been called away by God, and it's like, is he okay? He is. He's just going to Rome. It's Wait fun. a minute. Is that there's like a? <laughs> Wait a minute. Mailbox cam. There's, there's a mailbox cam. Look hey, at lady. That. That's show actually me all the cool. recordings of the mailbox. We've been playing with this thing like crazy, and we'll probably review it next week. This okay. So. I'm going to tell you about this. Okay. You tell me how much you'd pay. This is a pan, tilt, zoom camera. You control from your iPhone or Android device. Mm -hmm. It also has the ability to patrol, go back and forth, and when it sees motion, alert you, or hears a sound, alert you. It has free two weeks of recordings, mm -hmm. so you can always go back. If you get a notification on your phone, you tap it, it'll show you what it just saw. It has a speaker in it, too, so you can say, hey, what are you doing in there? So... HD recordings, HD camera with uh, two weeks of recordings. It has an SD card, so you can even get more if you want. It has uh, a microphone, a speaker. It's always on the internet. How much would you pay? What's your guess? Uh, well, do I do the see, do I do the Apple pricing and round no, it up? No, no, no. Add, that, a, add one hundred and fifty dollars and round <laughs> it up. The Nest Cam would be, I think, it's two twenty nine to to fifty something like that for this. Yeah, I'd say three hundred. Yeah, thirty dollars. What? Yeah, the Wise Cam Pan, $30, so $8 shipping. When did they go out of business? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I think what it tells you, and actually I was talking about this on the radio show, and I think you can thank Apple for this. It tells you how cheap it is now to manufacture stuff in China. And partly that's because Apple has really cranked out a billion iPhones mm -hmm. out of Shenzhen. And in the process, they've polished the process, the Chinese... Uh, companies really know how to do this manufacture right. All the pieces in this thing, many of them, not the servos, but everything else, probably are based on iPhone parts that Apple perfected. Uh, this thing is uh, remarkable, and I think it's because of the iPhone that you could say you can get something like this for $30. $30. I know. 30 I ordered three. 
Is it HD? <coughs> yeah. It's good wow. quality. Look at that. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> Let's get the mail it's out. It's not a bag. Close that up. Uh, there's cameras everywhere. Cameras are everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Pick an email, any email. I, sir, got email number one, so I shall start. You always get email number one. No, you host prerogative. You got it. I just, it's random. I let you pick. Mm. And somehow you always win. Somehow I always win. The house always wins. <laughs> Fred writes, hi, Leo. Hi. Hi, Fred. Hi, Fred. You mentioned it's a good idea to use Mac's file vault encryption. Is the encryption local to the computer? Or does it stay encrypted when mirroring to an external drive via super duper? Well, that's a good question. What about in the cloud, like on Carbonite? I have a 2010 MacBook Pro. I'm not sure how much longer the computer will be alive. I get a lot of beach balling. If it died on mm. me, ooh, would my backups be no longer accessible because the only key that could unlock it all would be on my dead computer? How does that all work, Fred? It's a good one. File Vault is, the answer is yes, it is local yeah. on your computer. Right. So if somebody ripped your hard drive out and took That's it away. That's the point of it. They couldn't get if any data. If they got your physical computer. That's right, but then you have the password and it unlocks it. To do Carbonite, to do backup to an external drive using Super Duper, you've unlocked your drive. And the files that are being copied are not encrypted anymore. They are. Right. Then Carbonite will take it and encrypt it and do their thing on their end. But it's not file vaulted anymore right. because you can see it, the, the apps you're running can see it, and then they can copy it. It's the same reason why if you copy a file to a server from a file vault computer, the file just copies. There's right. no encrypted file. It's, it's being decrypted before your Mac even sees it. Right. It's the, the, the same thing with Windows BitLocker. Yeah. It's the same thing with hard drives uh, that have locks built into their firmware. Yeah. All of that is unlocked once you're using the operating system, or so you wouldn't be able to see yeah. the files. Yeah, so you unlock it, it stays unlocked. From the view of the operating system, there's a layer that's decrypting it, right. and the drive itself is locked, which right. is, that's great, because if somebody walks away, theoretically, they walk away with your, your laptop, right. somebody could, even without your password, pull your hard drive out and read the data on it. But if you're using encryption, there, there's just garbage. So I always turn File Vault on, on all yeah. my computers. And but if you're afraid of File Vault, because the first version of File Vault on Apple stuff was janky. It really was. It, was, it slowed things down. Yeah. Modern systems new, and File Vault 2, um, on the most modern Macs, it's got an encryption chip built into it. It doesn't slow it down at all. Oh. It happens just on the fly. Yep. I think on the newest Macs, like the iMac Pro, I think it's on, I think you have to. It's I, on by default. You may not, I mean, you may be able to turn it off, but like really it's, you it are expected yeah. to have it on. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not gonna slow you down. It doesn't make your device less secure. In fact, it makes it much easier if you, on your iPhone, you used to erase your iPhone, and then it would say, please wait 10 minutes while I slowly erase anymore. it. Now all it does is it erases your encryption key. Just the key. It's gibberish. And then gibberish. that's it. It's garbage. You're done. The, the, so it's, yeah, it's a great feature. People should use it. However, no reason not to. Fred, now that you said this, it made me think, well, if somebody came to my house, instead of stealing my Mac, they just take my super duper backup. That's all unencrypted. Yeah, unless your super duper backup is going to an encrypted drive. Oh, or an well, encrypted disk image, which is what you out, should do. Figure out a way to make that encrypted. Yeah. No, so I now, now all the thieves know where to go <laughs> yes. for your data. I have behind my iMac like five drives of you know I have a Drobo that's everything's being backed up uh, you know behind right. my any one of those would be unencrypted and you could just Depen take it. depends on the the software. If you're using some um, backup get, software that has encryption, see. then yeah. it wouldn't yeah. be. Whoops. Or if you're using an encrypted drive. Whoops. All this time, but the biggest thing is, vault. I think the most likely scenario, unless They're you're a spy or something, is you yeah. you got your laptop in the airport or right. out at a cafe. That's I had where a friend, you really need it. I had yeah. a friend who was sitting at a Starbucks, and somebody literally just walked by, yeah. grabbed their laptop, and ran to the curb. Yeah. And like at that point, you you would really like them to not be able to get your data. Excellent. You have all a right. Question. Letter number it's two. Question two, but okay. Um. Why? Hey, new screensavers. That's us. Hey. Why doesn't iTunes, the TV app, and the Photos app work the same across all Apple devices? <laughs> There's no TV app on my Mac. This is so true. <laughs> if I buy a song, it shows up on every device. But if I want to get videos across all my devices, I have to import it to iTunes on my Mac, convert it to an MP4, <laughs> sync them all manually. It feels like the iTunes people and the iOS people work for different companies. Can you help? Signed, Steve. That's a great question. It's so true. I it never thought so about true. that. Apple doesn't want to make it easy for you to sync videos, right? Now, what I do when I buy stuff on uh, iTunes 
is I add it to my, it used to be called Disney Anywhere. I don't know what they call it now. Yeah, it's Movies Anywhere Movies now. Anywhere. So that I can get it from other devices. Right, you can see it in your Amazon locker and your Voodoo locker. Yeah. Um, Which I means I could, see, I could stream it on my phone. But if you've got a home movie or if you've got uh, right. something you ripped off of a DVD or a Blu-ray that, you know, that belongs to you, what do you do? I, the, the reality is Apple doesn't want to put together a sync system for this. So I use Plex. Plex is a solution. Which is a, it's a great app. There's a, you yeah. can subscribe to get extra features. And I actually do that because I put all those files on Plex on my Mac. And my iPad and my iPhone can see Plex running on my Mac. And I can copy the files from there, and they can live on my iPad, or I can even stream them um, nice. from the Mac. And I think that's the best solution here. I wish I could say with some confidence that Apple was going to make it much easier for you to move videos around between all these different devices. But they want to make it easier for you to buy them or rent them on iTunes, not bring them in from other sources. Well, and that may have something to do with Hollywood's Absolutely it does. Yeah. Absolutely it yeah, does. They want to make that piracy. They, they, they do want to make it like, I mean, you could put a pirated movie on iCloud or something like that if you wanted to, but it still doesn't really have the same access. You're not going to be able to use the TV app. Plex. So Plex is my answer. I think it's really great if you've got a big cache of video files. I agree. That's, that's what I do. Jason Snell is at sixcolors.com. That's his website. I am. Uh, really a must read if you're into uh, it's not just Apple it's a, it's a lot of other, it's other stuff, stuff too, too. Yeah. sure yeah and of course he's got great podcasts you find them can I go to sixcolors.com and find your podcast? yeah the podcasts are linked to from there, there they're at the incomparable.com and relay FM for my tech stuff yeah upgrade download hey, look, there's so many upgrade you can upgrade you can download <laughs> you can do all the lift all, off all the great shows lift off space if you really dug the Mars segment today, oh. check out the Liftoff podcast I do with Stephen Hackett. You can find our Tumblr at liftoffpodcast.space. Nice. That's my favorite domain. Nice. Dot space. Very nice. Excellent. It's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming Thank up. you for having me. It's always a pleasure to Come be here. Come back soon. Sure, absolutely. Next Just call. Week, Jason Howell. Well, you well, know, you, got, you got your Jason for next I got, week. I got a Jason next week, but maybe the week after. We'll, yeah, we'll there's there. always another Jason. <laughs> we do the new screensaver Saturday afternoons, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 2200 UTC. If you want to watch live, you can at twit.tv slash live. You can also be in our studio audience. Just email tickets at twit.tv if you're going to be in Northern California. We're in a little town called Petaluma. If you can make it to Petaluma, we'd love to see you in our audience but if you can't watch live or be here live you can always stream on demand everything we do is at our website twit.tv in the case of this show twit.tv slash nss or you subscribe in your favorite podcatcher and that way audio or video you'll have the show the minute it's available on saturday evening so you'll never be without you'll never be bereft there's always a new screensavers. We also have a great newsletter you can subscribe to at twit.tv slash newsletter. It's no salesman will call. It's, uh, it's GDPR compliant. It's just a, a little newsletter about stuff that's coming up on the, in the week ahead. Actually, you know what I'm going to put in the newsletter? Remind me. People are wondering about this beautiful shirt. I want to thank my friend Winton Churchill. He lives in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. And there's a wonderful store there called Abrazos, which means hug where they sell these incredible shirts. Actually, they have all this material. They also have tortilla warmers, towels, <laughs> anything you want. Their website is sanmigueldesigns.com, so I'll give, I'll give them a plug. This one is wild. This one's, they're getting wilder and wilder in designs. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Leo. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time on the new screensavers. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye.